this brand new edition on Monday evening. Well, on this segment, we're going to focus on uh, one story that has caused quite a political uproar here in India. A political storm is currently brewing in India over a report that has appeared in the New York Times. The report alleges that the Communist Party of China has been using dangerous tools and funding news organizations, journalists, political parties and other agencies and individuals around the world, including in India, to insidiously promote Chinese propaganda often disguised as independent news and editorial content. The BJP used the report in Parliament today to launch a blistering attack on the Congress, claiming that the Grand Old Party has been colluding with the Chinese to divide India. The BJP is sought to know if the Congress has been receiving Chinese funding. Let's make it clear though that the New York Times story makes no mention of the Congress. It however states that 38 crore rupees has been given to a digital news outlet in India called News Click. This news portal was raided by the Enforcement Directorate in 2021. The BJP says News Click has been colluding with anti-India forces to divide the nation and that the Chinese money was given to Naxals and a number of journalists to create an atmosphere against India. The New York Times has accused American millionaire and Shanghai-based Neville Roy Singham of working closely with the Chinese government media machine and financing its propaganda worldwide. The report further adds that in New Delhi, Singham's network financed news click that sprinkled his coverage with Chinese government talking points. The 69-year-old millionaire has denied working on the directions of the Chinese government. But here in India, Information and Broadcasting Minister Anurag Thakur said, India has been highlighting how news click is a dangerous tool of misinformation that is used for anti-India narratives and the arrogant Congress, China and news click are part of an umbilical cord. An anti-India and break India narrative is being spread by these elements, he said. The minister questioned the Congress's stand when it had criticized the raids on news click, calling it a crackdown on freedom of expression. Alleging China Congress links the BJP government claims that whenever Rahul Gandhi travels abroad, he promotes Chinese agenda. Now, as per this New York Times piece, Singham and his associates are at the forefront of what Communist Party authorities call a smokeless war. During President Xi Jinping's leadership, China has broadened its state media endeavors, forged partnerships with international outlets and nurtured foreign influencers. The overarching objective is to present propaganda as authentic, independent content. The outcome is an apparently spontaneous proliferation of left-leaning groups that mirror Chinese government messaging, echo each other's viewpoints and in turn find their echoes in Chinese state media. Singham's political activism has been criticized by some who accuse him of being a Chinese stooge. However, Singham has defended his work, saying he's simply trying to promote peace and understanding between China and the West. Singham says he does not work at the directions of the Chinese government, but the line between him and the propaganda apparatus seems to be rather blurry. He shares office space and his groups share staff members with a company whose goal is to educate foreigners about Quote unquote, the miracles that China has created on the world stage and the goal seems to be to disguise propaganda as independent content. This new revelation further reinforces the threat that our country, our democratic society, our open media faces when a group of people and vested interests get together, invest in platforms, and these groups operate in remarkable coordination. They cross post, they share each other's content, they share a remarkably common, consistent goal lies and hatred about our Honorable Prime Minister, lies and hatred about the government fanning communal disharmony and incitement. We have seen this in Manipur recently. We have seen this in the farmers' agitation. There is a remarkable convergence of strategy. And they fan a consistent narrative. And ironically, as 
Anurag Bhai said, there is one political leader who is consistent with this narrative. These narratives that are put out by platforms like NewsClick and other platforms that are operating in concert are echoed almost blandly in a similar fashion by this political leader Rahul Gandhi who goes abroad and says exactly the same things. Democracy is under danger, the judiciary is compromised, the EVMs are compromised, which is exactly the narrative that these platforms put out. I don't want to say any more excepting to say this is neither simple nor is it some innocent activity. This is a complex conspiracy. This is a network of operators being funded, being fanned by vested interests outside the country who are opposed to India's rise, opposed to India's confidence in the global community of nations opposed to a growing economy and growing presence in the global value chains across the board in manufacturing and innovation. China, news click, a part of a umbilical cord. And this is also the same thing. Because some people have also remembered that, and I can say the name of the name, that Rahul Ji in the Nakli Mohabbat store, चीनी सामान के साफ नजर आने लगा है चीन के प्रति प्यार ये दिखता था और भारत के खिलाफ दुष्प्रचार ये विदेशी जमीन पर भी और विदेशी न्यूज एजेंसियों के माध्यम से भी प्रोपोगंडा के तहत होता था एक एजेंडा था एंटी इंडिया ब्रेक इंडिया कैंपेन ये लोग चलाते थे और इनके यहां इनके यहां सारा सामान चीनी है और चीन को सम्मान है All right, to put that big story into perspective for us, we are now joined live from Washington, D.C. by Ramakrishnan Sridharan, consulting editor with News 9. Sri, welcome to Global Lens. Great to have you on the show. My pleasure and thank you for having me, Neha, on your show. Well, look forward to interacting with you on a daily basis, Sri. Uh, let me start by asking you, you know, I just mentioned at the start of the show, this is a story that's created quite a political storm in India. Now, looking at the big picture, you would agree that China's growing expansionism and hegemonic designs are something that are causing alarm in many parts of the world, including India and the US. These countries have repeatedly expressed grave concern. And we've seen multiple manifestations of this expansionism and hegemony, as it were. Apart from the domestic political bickering that this New York Times story has triggered here in India, what kind of reactions, I'm curious, has it evoked in the United States? Has it caused as much concern there as it has here in India? Uh, of course, this is a big story here as well, Neha. But we must first understand why does China even need someone like a Neville Roy Singham? China's need for someone like that arises from its state of desperation at the moment. Uh, as we know, the whole world is now moving away from China towards other countries like India for very simple reasons. China hasn't played the world game fair and square. Uh, U.S. in particular, where there's a huge anti-China sentiment, whether it is in the local people, uh, the Americans or the administration, are really unhappy about the fact that for years, China has stolen a lot of IP from America and gone on to build its own companies without any regard for patents, rights or any royalty or any such thing. So that is something which hasn't gone down well uh, with the American administration, which has finally woken up to the fact that it has given a free right to China all these years. So there is a huge anti-China sentiment which is prevailing in the US right now, whether it's at the administration or even at the down to uh, the masses. So that is something China desperately needs to counter. It needs to come across as a country which has done no wrong, that it's a friendly country, that its growth is purely because of the hard work and the planning that the government has done over the years. So that's the narrative that China wants to build. 
And that narrative can only come from people like Neville Roy Singham, who are sympathetic to China, uh, if not on the payrolls of China, which he has denied, uh, although there are many factors and evidences which suggest that he is uh, quite close to the Chinese Communist government. All right, plenty of indications there that he is close to the government. Has he been doing the bidding for the Communist Party of China? That remains the big question. And surely this is a story that's going to continue to generate a heated debate, I guess, especially here in India. Stay on with us, Sri. We're coming back to you in just a moment. Moving on to our second big story of the day. Now, days after his indictment for efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election and appearance in a Washington court, former U.S. President and 2024 presidential hopeful Donald Trump seems to be using every trick in the book to delay his trial in the unprecedented case. Taking to his uh, truth social platform, Trump launched a scathing attack on the American capital, describing it as a filthy and crime-ridden embarrassment. Facing a federal trial on conspiracy and obstruction charges while also being the prime Republican contender for the White House ahead of the 2024 elections, Trump is evidently trying to have the trial moved to a more politically favorable location. In his all capital letters post, Trump wrote, and I quote, no way can I get a fair trial or even close to a fair trial in Washington, D.C. He argued that such a move would be unpopular with potential jurors. Not only that, Trump has announced his intention to seek the recusal of Judge Tanya Chutkin on grounds which he claims are very powerful, even though he has provided no evidence whatsoever to support this claim. Judge Tanya was appointed by former President Barack Obama, a Democrat. Now, the indictment against Trump that was handed down in Washington last week accuses him of knowingly spreading falsehoods about the 2020 election being rigged aiming to undermine faith in the voting process and retain power. Besides this trial, he faces separate criminal prosecutions in New York and Florida, and there are potential charges pending in Georgia, all while he continues with his presidential campaign. Meanwhile, former Republican Vice President Mike Pence, who is now Trump's rival in the 2024 race, has not ruled out the possibility of becoming a prosecution witness in the trial against his former boss. Interestingly, Trump, who has been indicted thrice already in multiple cases, has also boasted, we need one more indictment to close out this election. Nobody even stands a chance. As we said, Trump continues to be the Republican frontrunner for the White House and some might argue that the indictments have indeed helped his popularity with his core support base grow further. Fake charges put forth by the Biden sham, we call it a sham indictment, and the, you know, the man that's doing it, I really believe he's uh, mentally ill. But this, these are outrageous, and it is an outrageous criminalization of political speech. They're trying to make it illegal to question the results of an election. But you don't have strong borders, and you don't have good elections, you really don't have a country. So they rigged the presidential election of 2020, and we're not going to allow them to rig the presidential election of 2024 because our country is not going to survive. Joe Biden is the most incompetent and corrupt president in United States history. The Biden crime family was taking in money from China, Ukraine, Russia, and many, many other countries. And now, whenever more Biden corruption is exposed, his henchmen charge me with crimes. All right, Shri, coming back to you at this point. Take the case out of Washington, D.C. I'm not going to get a fair trial. Change the judge. Some would say Trump is just being Trump and using every trick in the book to delay the trial. His focus obviously being on the presidential election campaign. But, you know, uh, he's gone as far as to say that Judge Tanya Chutkin will not uh, be able to give him a fair trial and he has quote unquote very powerful grounds to seek her refusal uh, her recusal I beg your pardon even though he has produced no evidence to back his claim what is Trump so afraid of the fact that Judge Tanya Chotkin was appointed by Barack Obama a Democrat or the fact that she's been rather tough on Capitol Hill rioters 
Well, uh, that would be a fair uh, summary of Mr. Trump's own uh, fears about the judge and the location of the case. But Neha, the point is uh, the judge is a fair judge. And when they look at a case, they look at all the available evidence. So the two things that Mr. Trump is asking for, which is that the case should be moved out of Washington, D.C. to West Virginia is not going to happen because the law on that issue is fairly well settled. The law and the Constitution very clearly says that the trial must happen in the place where the alleged crime was committed. And in this case, this is Washington, D.C. So the uh, court, the trial will be held in D.C. unless there is some exceptional reason that the Trump lawyers are able to come up with. But right now, we can't see any exceptional reason why they'll be granted that sort of a privilege. Number two, uh, uh, Mr. Trump has also asked that, uh, that, uh, that the judge, uh, Tanya Chutkan, uh, recuse herself. Again, that's phased based on his fear that she may not be fair. But there is nothing, again, which suggests that uh, the judge is not going to be fair. So I don't think uh, either of the two things, either shifting the case out of D.C. or recusing uh, the judge is going to happen. And Mr. Trump will have to go with what is a well laid out judicial process in the United States. Unfortunately, he has to follow that and see what the outcome is. All right. Uh, you know, Shri, I have a lot of Trump questions for you, but because we have limited time on the show, I'm going to fire these quick couple of questions at you before we move oh, on to ahead. the next story. Number one, there are those who actually believe now that Trump may well be running for the White House again, essentially to escape prison. Is that an assessment you share, number one? Number two, many have also pointed out that the deeper Trump gets into legal troubles, the more popular he seems to actually become with his core support base. Do you think that is the case even now with this latest indictment? Two very interesting questions that you asked, Neha. One, of course, well, I can't speak for Mr. Trump, but the fact is he is running for the 2024 presidential election and he is the Republican front runner by far. I mean, he's more popular than most leaders uh, right now, Republican leaders in the United States. So he's the number one candidate uh, as far as the Republican Party is concerned. Number two, whether he's running for uh, the presidential office so that he can stay out of prison. Well, uh, that would only happen if he becomes the president and he's able to pardon himself. Now, there is no constitutional precedence where a president has actually uh, conducted a pardon of his own crimes. Uh, uh, and uh, it's it's evident that uh, it, 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 whatever would be the precedent, it's a gray area. But the fact remains that Constitution or the Supreme Court here will not look kindly on any president who uh, you know pardons himself his own crime. So you can't be the committer of the crime and also your own judge. So that principle law law will get violated, and that is why even if Mr. Trump tries to pardon himself. Once, if he becomes a president, it will definitely go to the Supreme Court and the pardon will be tested there. The presidential power to pardon himself will be tested at the Supreme Court. That is number one. Uh, the other thing, uh, uh, how are people looking at it? I mean, he's by far the most popular uh, front runner. And uh, the other question that you wanted to ask me uh, was about, just remind me again, what was it about? Uh, uh, whether uh, you believe that his popularity has only soared since his third indictment. Absolutely. So what we have seen is that when Mr. Trump said he needs one more indictment to be the by far the presidential uh, candidate of choice, he wasn't joking. So every time there is a new case or an indictment brought against Mr. Trump, his funding actually goes up. So uh, with every indictment, there's more money that's coming coming in to support him. So Mr. Trump, in some sense, is very, very popular with his uh, voter base. And we do see him becoming more powerful as the, uh, the government, as the uh, federal agencies uh, put new cases or bring indictment against him. He is becoming more popular and stronger as a presidential candidate. Becoming more popular and stronger 
and uh, Trump being Trump, who knows he may very well get elected to the White House and if he does get uh, convicted later, he is quite capable as we know of pardoning himself. Though of course it has been pointed out that that could very well trigger a constitutional crisis in the United States which does not have a precedent for this kind of a situation. Alright, Shri, let's now turn our attention to the Russia-Ukraine war. In the latest escalation between Russia and Ukraine, on Monday explosions hit critical road bridges linking occupied Crimea with parts of Kherson region under Russian control. It has been seen as Ukraine's escalation in its targeting of Russian infrastructure and territory. The blasts came on the same day when the Moscow mayor said a drone had been shot down approaching the city and soon after, Ukraine struck one of Russia's biggest oil tankers with a sea drone, carried out an attack on a major naval base. Acting Kherson Regional Governor Vladimir Saldo, a Moscow appointee, claimed the strike on one of the three road links between Crimea and mainland Ukraine involved an Anglo-French storm shadow missile, though he offered no evidence. Ukraine had struck the same bridge in June. Saldo also said that Ukrainian shelling damaged a village school and a gas pipeline running alongside a bridge leaving more than 20,000 people without gas. The attacks are making it increasingly hard to get on and off the Crimean Peninsula which Russia seized from Ukraine in 2014 and which is of military significance to Moscow as well as a popular tourist destination for Russians. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Zelensky has said that Ukraine has shot down a significant part of Moscow's attacks over the past week, which included 65 missiles of various kinds and 178 assault drones, including 87 Shahids, despite waves of Russian airstrikes that Kiev says targeted residential buildings and civilians, leaving some dead. Also, in a related development, Saudi Arabia hosted talks on the conflict in Ukraine over the weekend. Some 40 countries, including India, China and the United States, represented by their national security advisors, attended the talks in Jeddah. Significantly, Russia was not invited to these talks. Diplomats said the Ukraine organized meetings were intended to engage a range of countries in debates about a path towards peace, notably members of the BRICS bloc that have adopted a somewhat neutral stance on the war in contrast to Western powers. Senior officials from these 40 countries try to carve a path towards an agreement on key principles for a peaceful end to Russia's war in Ukraine. Ukrainian President Zelensky wants the talks to lead to a peace summit of global leaders, which he has hinted might in fact take place in autumn. Saudi Arabia, the world's biggest crude exporter, which works closely with Moscow on oil policy, has touted its ties to both sides and positioned itself as a possible mediator in the war. In May this year, the kingdom hosted Zelensky at an Arab summit. Zelensky had then accused some world leaders of turning a blind eye to the horrors of Russia's invasion. Meanwhile, Moscow has called the Jera meeting a doomed attempt to swing the global south behind Kiev. L let's go back to Sri and get his perspective from Washington on this story. Uh, again, two points here, Sri. Number one, do you see the attacks on the Crimean Bridge as a significant escalation between Russia and Ukraine? Because it seems to be a particularly sensitive issue for the Kremlin, you would agree. And two, what more can you tell us about the significance of the Jera talks and whether any headway has been made? Right. So the attack on the uh, bridges, the two bridges in Crimea were indeed unfortunate, coming as they did at a time when Ukraine itself had invited uh, Saudi Arabia to host an event uh, where 40 countries would come together and discuss the 10 principles on which, uh, you know, uh, the country wants to uh, stitch a peace proposal together. So the least one would expect is for these countries to first get into some sort of a ceasefire negotiation before they actually start talking an ambitious peace project. So uh, in that sense, uh, Neha, it leads me to the second question, like what do I make of the, uh, the meeting that happened in Jeddah? Uh, what was the outcome? Well, well the Ukraine has uh, the Ukraine uh, counterpart, they've described it as productive. Uh, Russia has completely trashed it, saying it's a doomed kind of a, a meeting, simply because they were not invited. And I don't think Russia would have uh, at this stage gone into a meeting without some basic principles uh, being settled. For example, Russia wants the territories which are in, which are now considered part of its constitution 
the Ukraine territories, which are part of uh, Russia now, as uh, envisaged in the constitution, to remain with Russia. So unless these big elephants in the room are dealt with first, I don't think there are there is going to be any real progress made as far as peace negotiations and any kind of a peace proposal uh, can can come to fruition, uh, Neha. Yes, and certainly going by the trans intransigence of the two sides, it would seem like neither of them really wants to give peace a chance at this point in time. Ramakrishnan Sridharan, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for being on Global Lens. My pleasure. Look forward to having you back tomorrow. Thank you, Sri. All right, on that note, let's slip into a quick break here on Global Lens, but don't go anywhere. There's lots more for you on the other side. मैं इमरान अहमद खान न्याजी सबके दिल से हल्फ उठाता हूँ When Imran Khan came initially into politics, he thought his personal popularity would be sufficient for him. It didn't happen.